before we begin, the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Now, I would like to... Oh, I don't have my copy. There it is. I would like to turn your attention to the brochure that you were handed, and you will see that uh, there's a little history given inside that was provided by Dr. Peter Murphy, and just tells you a little bit about the Phil's lectures and how long it's been going on for, and, and as I mentioned, it's our 82nd uh, lecture, which is quite fantastic. Uh, in addition, uh, there's also the list of our sponsors, and our 35 sponsors. It's quite fantastic. So with that, I'd just like to read out those sponsors very quickly in acknowledgement. And it's in alphabetical order. Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, Forestry Division. Alberta Association of Forest Management Professionals. Alberta Forest Products Association. Alberta Innovates. Alberta Pacific Forest Industries, Inc. Altus Group Limited. ANC Timber Limited. Canadian Forest Products Limited. Canadian Institute of Forestry, Rocky Mountain Section, Carson Integrated, Con E. Dermot Environmental and Forestry Services, DLA Piper Canada Inc., Earth Econ Inc., Envirostat Solutions Inc., Four Core Solutions Inc., Forest Soil Science Limited, Forest Soil Consulting Limited, that is a new sponsor who's joining us for the first time, FB Innovations, FRI Research, Genome Alberta, also a new sponsor, GreenLink Forestry Inc., Incremental Forest Technologies Limited, Miller Western Forest Products Limited, MNP, LLP, what all the letters? Natural Resources Canada, Northern Forestry Centre, Norboard Inc., PwC Canada, Silvacom Limited, The Lernell Group, another new sponsor, Tolco Industries Limited, Vanderwell Contractors 1971 Limited, West Fraser Mills Limited, Warehouser Company Limited, Wild and Pine, Woodland Operations Learning Foundation. So again, a total of 35 and, a, and an amazing mixture of consulting <coughs> companies and forest companies. Um, it's really changed over the years from just forest companies with a much broader community now participating and sponsoring this event. <laughs> So without any further ado, I would like to invite our Dean, Dr. Stan Blade, uh, Dean of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences, um, who will bring us greetings from the faculty. Very good. Dean Blade. Well, thanks, Barb. It's uh, fantastic uh, to have all of you here. Thank you very much for coming out uh, to the 82nd Phil's Lecture. Um, you know, I see the Phil's as a little bit of a celebration of the forest industry, and if I look around this room, there are so many people that have made such a major contribution to the work that we do within the Faculty of Ales, but to the broader forest industry. So there's a lot to celebrate, I would say. Uh, you've heard me talk and others about the fact that the uh, forest program at the University of Alberta ranked what in the world? Fifth, well done. Not even a plant necessarily, well done. <laughs> High five to you too, exactly right. Uh, but we also had the new QS rankings that came out this year around all things environmental sciences. And what was the University of Alberta? Eight. <laughs> uh, that was eight for the people that are out there somewhere in the world. And we share that glory with our colleagues in the Faculty of Science and a few other things, but much to celebrate. Certainly also have the opportunity to celebrate the past uh, governance of the, of the department that houses the work of forestry. And I know that there are a number of our uh, past chairs. I, I think Vic Liefers is here. Uh, uh, I think Jim Beck is here as well. And I certainly see John Spence without a cigar for some reason, which I guess is probably part of the university's uh, code of conduct or something at this point. So celebrating the, the past individuals that have been so important in driving the forestry program. And then we have the current department 
chair of Renewable Resources, Dr. Colin McDonald, who this year won uh, an amazing scientific achievement award from uh, the International Union of Forestry Research Organizations. So I think a round of applause for the whole gang that's out there. <laughs> So we're certainly looking, I'm very much looking forward to, to Don Haidt's uh, lecture. It was great to see him in uh, Weyerhaeuser headquarters in Seattle uh, earlier this year. Uh, uh, this will just be, uh, I'm sure, a sort of remarkable tour on a couple of, a number of key things that we need to, uh, to hear about as well. I guess there's one other last thing that I would celebrate, and that is the fact that in 2020, we are going to celebrate 50 years of the forestry program at the University of Alberta. And just one of the cool things that is happening is this remarkable calendar. At this moment, one of the few in existence, which captures all of the elements and aspects of the last 50 years. I think I was expected to carry this under like a briefcase with a handcuff on it because it's a, it's a very much sought after item. But if you're interested in seeing where this uh, particular uh, the kind of things that are in this calendar, talk to Cynthia Strassen, if I could introduce her here, uh, who has been instrumental in pulling all of this together. And I'll just end by saying thank you certainly to all of our sponsors. You heard Dr. Thomas Lay uh, provide that long list of remarkable contributors. There's a reason why we're in our 82nd fills. It's because of contributors, so, uh, people like you and partners uh, that I see in this room as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm just very grateful for that. So welcome to the lecture. Uh, and without further ado, I'll invite uh, our vice dean, uh, uh, Dr. Vic Adamovitz, uh, to introduce our speaker. Let's uh, round of applause for Dr. Adamovitz. <laughs> our Phil speaker, Don Haid. So I'll put a couple of facts together. Don is Corporate Economist Director of Industry Analysis for Warehouse. We've got that part. Don's a U of A alum, and we're really proud of all of Don's achievements, achievements in the public sector, achievements in the private sector. He's one of those folks that's worked in lots of different places, and I think that's why we're excited to hear the presentation today. BSc Forestry in 83, MSc in Forest Economics in 86, of course, here from the University of Alberta. 86 was about the time that I was starting as a new professor. We sort of overlapped a bit. Uh, a couple of inside baseball stories. My spouse was Don's office mate as graduate students. We have a couple other colleagues who were here about the same time. I could tell some other colorful stories, but we agreed last night that we we're happy there were no cameras on phones or Twitter or Facebook at that time, so we're just going to leave it silent. We've all forgotten all those stories. We might revisit a couple later on. But there, there was a lively social community at that time among the economists and what was in rural economy and the forestry folks, and I think it was great to experience that, and it's great to see how Don's done so well since then. PhD from University of California, Berkeley. Prior to joining Warehouse, we worked for the Canadian Forest Service for about eight years. I was out of Ottawa working on a number of cross-Canada issues and a consultant with AMEC, uh, AMEC Simons. And currently works on housing, wood products, et cetera. Don and I were just chatting before the lecture that when you go, you go online and you look up an academic, often we have academics at Phil's, you get the 47-page CV with all the things that are in there. When you go look at Don's web presence, you don't really see that much. But the achievements are really in how he's moved through Weyerhaeuser in the career and moved to that senior position within the company. And I think we're really looking forward to learn from the industrial experience that you have, as well as all the other wisdom you've gathered. Um, Don and his, and his spouse, Halliday, who's also here, are uh, supporters of the faculty and the University of Alberta. And we are very proud and pleased that you are alumni and that you're supporters of us and the work that we do. So with that. Please welcome Don, and I look forward to the presentation on North America's forest industry, interdisciplinary applied scientists needed.
There it is. Okay, so it sounds like marketing, doesn't it? Interdisciplinary applied scientists needed. Um, Vic went through some of my resume CV details. I am a forester from here. I am a forest economist from here. And those colorful stories also represent a pretty important time in my life as far as you know, growing academically, personally. But what I really want to recognize and try and link some parts together in this conversation is the training that I received here was, and forestry by definition is an interdisciplinary applied field. And that's a remarkable thing, but it's served me extremely well through continuing education and my professional career. And I'm a real firm believer in you know, building a toolkit and having the adaptive tools to go forward and be a lifetime learner. So that's the reason behind some of that, like I say, marketing type description. And so while I'm thankful for Vic for his comments and, and the invitation to come here and to speak to you, for me it's really an honor because I, I would like to recognize and hopefully convince some people of the importance of applied work and that whole interdisciplinary um, pursuit, if you will. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. But I would also like to um, recognize and thank Peter Murphy. When I was an undergraduate here, I was taking his senior policy class. And one of the things that went on, you heard Vic mention my graduation year, 1983. Well, there was a, a trade petition that initiated in 1982, but was first actually litigated in 1983. It happened during that class. And it's affectionately now known as Softwood Lumber One, but it was the countervailing duties petition against Canadian imports by the U.S. Department of Com well, it was being assessed by the U.S. Department of Commerce. The, the complaint originated from what is now called the Coalition for Fair Lumber Imports. So, Lumber One, with a Roman numeral. In my career, um, I spent five years working on Lumber Four, which was 2000 through 2006. We are currently in lumber, what is known as lumber five. And the other part of my title is North America's forest industry. And I could talk about Alberta's forest industry. I could talk about the US forest industry. But if we're going to talk about wood products and what is truly the industry, it is North American. And there's rivalry between not just the countries, but the different regions. I'm going to show you a little bit about that. And that's when being at least for me, an economist, you know, that gave me the frame of reference for how to think about it and how to analyze it. But that Peter Murphy story in Softwood 1 through 5 is important because we are so codependent. We may be at war, but we've been at war eternally, right? But we need each other in, in the worst way. And I'm a dual citizen. I'm living proof that it can, it's possible, I guess you could say. So with that as kind of an intro, Let's actually get into the, the whole story. What do I want to talk about? Um, I'm going to give you, I, I think everyone has their own notion of what the forest industry is. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I perceive it and understand it. I just mentioned why I believe it's a North American industry. I think you're incomplete if you just talk about it in a regional sense or a single species sense. And then how does it work? And that's when you know, I'm going to start with economics, but all the moving parts be it inventory, science, policy, all the rest. And a shout out to Alberta, and we'll get to that too, very competitive. The other thing I'll just mention, um, as a professional working for Weyerhaeuser who does speak up sometimes, and a lot of my role involves you know, uh, market analysis, and sometimes I make forward-looking statements. I didn't put in my safe harbor, but what that says would say, and I'm going to say it orally as opposed to in print, I may speak of the future, and I may be wrong. <laughs> and that's so, not so much you don't sue me, don't sue Weyerhaeuser. <laughs> um, <laughs> and more importantly, I'm speaking as an individual who works for Weyerhaeuser. I'm not speaking for Weyerhaeuser, and that's a subtle difference. OK, that's taken care of. So I also believe it's really important how you think about it. When I've worked inside our company, when I work with people in the Timberlands business, they're what I call timber forward, trees forward. If you plant it, if you grow it, 
somebody will want it kind of thing. But the other way it works is from the market back. And my favorite analogy for all of that is a statement that was attributed to one of our senior vice presidents uh, in Timberlands. But if we're thinking about you know, how is timber valued, what's timber worth? And it isn't just monetary worth, but it can be amenity services. But this was my favorite line. What's, what's the value of a standing tree? What's shade worth on a sunny day? I mean, you know, until, until somebody needs it, it's not worth anything. I mean, that you need a, need a market demand or a transaction or something, which doesn't preclude existence value, by the way. I don't want to, you know, get derailed on that. Anyway, um, so why analyze it? Um, to support decision making. I mean, my role inside the company is what would be affectionately called decision support. What does that mean? It means I do a lot of work, but I don't actually make any decisions. I try to sway people, but I don't, um, you know, they, they will make the operating decisions, the capital decisions. So the analysis has to be, you know, tight. It has to be concise. And what are the things we tend to look at? Well, obviously, if you're a private enterprise, um, you're looking to look, you know, take care of your shareholders. So you're in a competitive business, and the pieces that matter our market size and access, you know, scarcity of resources, because that tends to be one of the drivers of value, and then competitive position. Are you um, the low cost provider, the high cost provider, the best, the worst? I mean, everyone thinks they're the best, but you need to look with a very dispassionate eye, um, not just at your rival across the road or the river, but in a totally different region, because this is a North American industry, and competition is international and interregional. But all that said, the decisions, and I said, I don't make decisions, I'm, I'm decision support, I'm an influencer. And it's been really great for me to watch the emergence of behavioral economics, because to me, this is the key of applied work and the difference between theoretical work and applied work, is people don't do the mathematically or the economically optimal thing according to theory. And so, I can be people in roles like mine, a broker um, in between, but you've got to be able to tell a story. You've got to be able to communicate. And you know, one of my favorite recent books was The Undoing Project by Michael Lewis, which was about Kahneman and Tversky. And you know, even those guys who were, you know, first of all, so far ahead of everyone else, but also, you know, maths and analytics smart, but and they could come up with the numbers and what, it sh what the answer should be. But if you can't tell a story, you don't go anywhere. So that's, that's a really important takeaway for me. OK. So what are we talking about here? And what analytic framework do I want to pursue? Well, as I said, I can't help being an economist. So I'm going to start from, from that perspective. And you know what we're talking about is an integrated supply chain. And I talked about whether it's market back or timber forward or resource forward, but it's a connected supply chain. And that, that matters probably more than anything else. But if we're talking about supply, that's determined by the resource. That's a raw material input to a conversion process, usually manufacturing. What are we talking about? That's saw logs and pulp wood. Demand comes from the other end. It originates from an end use um, and requires the products that come out of the manufacturing business. And so what are our products typically? I'm going to focus on lumber, but it includes panels. And there's this huge sector, pulp and paper. And I'm not going to talk very much about it, but it's, it's obviously a, an enormous consumer of um, forest resources as well. So this is the, the framework and gives us the opportunity to apply theory and recognizing, as the behavioral economists have helped us understand better, supply and demand are always mm -hmm. equilibrium seeking but for reasons you know we can't fully explain they don't stay there they're always above or below or in disequilibrium but that's the messy nature of the world that makes this work worth doing and it really is what separates us from you know the theoretical so what are we talking about here i call it derived demand um, so the demand for logs Timber, pro timber comes from the products, but the product demand actually comes from some end use. So what are we talking about? If it's softwood lumber, housing is most of where the demand lives. And what's that? Demand for what? Is it demand for lumber? No, it's demand for shelter. 
So in North America, we have a tradition of light wooden frame construction, and that is because it is inexpensive, um, provides quality you know, surroundings, homes, um, and it uses softwood lumber. And that's it. That's, that's what the sort of the nexus of that demand is. Related to that, also housing is repair and remodel. So, you know, you either want to expand your home or your home needs to be fixed, often results in consumption of wood products. It also, you know, can result in consumption of granite countertops or, you know, a whole bunch of other things. And I'm going to mention that because one of the things I track is expenditures for repair and remodel. And oh, if it were all going to wood products, that'd be wonderful, but that's not how it happens. And then there's the industrial side, and that accounts for the rest of demand. And that can be every, anything from, you know, marine timbers to interior truck bodies to furniture. Um, and that tends to closely follow something as simple as GDP. So, you know, if you can follow housing and GDP and maybe consumer confidence, you've got a lot of the demand drivers right there. Um, from the pulp and paper side, it's a little different animal. So paper consumption per capita from developed countries has been flat to declining, but in emerging countries, still rising, and it tends to be for um, personal care items, tissue toweling, papers like that. Um, so, you know, you've got this globally traded commodity. It can be made from hardwood or it can be made from softwood. The end uses are everything from old analog paper, um, communication papers like newsprint and, and uh, letter stock, things like that, but also then all those personal care items. But this goes back to the derived demand. There isn't demand for pulp. There's a demand for things made from pulp, and they tend to be closely related to um, income level. So let's go back to lumber and look for where the demand comes from. These are the, the primary segments, industrial, repair and remodel, and residential. If you put residential and repair and remodel together, you get 60% of demand. One of the old um, sort of truisms is that residential or new home construction only accounts for 30% of demand, but 90% of any cyclic movement. And that tends to be true if you look at the you know, the huge dislocation in demand that we saw after the recession or during the recession, which was actually housing induced, a credit bubble, lending, uh, impro inappropriate lending, shall we say, for uh, homes. But, you know, where was residential demand before and where is it after? Um, you, you can see the impact. But, you know, this is just kind of confirmation of what I said earlier as far as that, if, that housing and related are the main movers here. If we look at housing now, not wood products consumption, housing starts, this is Canada and the US, and it's separated into single family and multifamily. And so a single family unit, not surprisingly, consumes considerably more lumber than a multifamily unit, but they both um, represent wood product demand. You can again see the impact of the recession, credit bubble bursting, um, in the U.S., Canada had far less of a slowdown in housing, and that's not by accident. First of all, there wasn't the excesses in the credit markets. Um, credit markets in Canada are more closely regulated. There's fewer institutions, the, the chartered banks. And most importantly, um, mortgage debt in Canada is recourse. In the U.S., it's not. And what does that mean? Well, in the US, if you default on a mortgage, you can declare bankruptcy, and that creates a mess for you, but eventually it goes away after five years. In Canada, if you default on your mortgage, that, there, that carries with you for your life and into your heirs. Um, so that in and of itself is one of the reasons why the Canadian um, real estate market, which is, by the way, overvalued and probably subject to a correction in the future, won't go through the sort of dislocation that happened in um, the US. The other thing to take away from these two panels is the emergence or the rise in the multifamily component. So you hear a lot about affordability. It hasn't been going up, it's been going down. And you know, uh, multifamily units are typically rented, not owned, but they're smaller and cost less. So the rise of multifamily is 
as a result, a consequence, both of demographics. So we've got you know another generation, just like the baby boomers when they first left college, there was a huge burst of um, multifamily construction then in the mid to late 70s. The millennials, same thing. As they get older and more established financially, we expect more um, single family demand. But so there's that demographic component, and then there's the overarching affordability pinch, which you know is a different sort of structural element than it was in, say, the 70s. OK, so that's new home construction. I mentioned the repair and remodeling component. If you want to think about what the main drivers there are, um, this shows Case Shiller, US home prices, the 10 and 20 city indexes. The important thing is you, know, you have the bubble, the rise in those home values, and then the collapse. But since then, through the recovery, the steady increase in home equity. That's what that, you know, really for owners, that's, that's equity, that's asset growth. And that gives them the opportunity to borrow against increased equity and improve either trade up or improve their surroundings. So that's the fuel, that's the money. And if you look at the other panel, um, this is one tracked by the Census Bureau. It's got a long name, but this is basically spending at stores like Home Depot. And like I said, it isn't all wood. In fact, there's not that much wood. But you can see the upward trajectory, the recovery since the recession to a level that exceeds where we were during the bubble. Now, you know, full disclosure, if you look at the last two quarters, it turned down. And that's not um, independent of the current US declared trade war against China. So one of the things we saw was some anticipated tariffs on you know, the kind of um, hard goods, that's, that'd be the washing machines and counters and things like that. And so some of that consumption was brought forward in anticipation of it costing more in a month or in a quarter. And um, that's part of the decline. And what we, um, as wood products manufacturers, are trying to decipher is this a, you know, a major inflection point or is the wood component not as impacted as the total dollar level as, as we see some of that um, decline. Uh, all that said, we're still talking about a much higher level of aggregate spending and therefore more money to spend on not just wood but washing machines, et cetera. Um, and that's generally a positive and indicative of, of a driver of this, this segment. So repair and remodel, typically the wood products component growth is you know, 4% a year. In the last two to three years during the steep part of that rise, it's been more like seven, so it's been a really good um, segment has grown a lot, but like all things, when it changes, even a small negative percent change, um, you notice it because we have, you know, as an industry, all the installed capacity, everybody wants to run full, and there's always the risk of overrunning the markets then. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward, but just to remind folks that, you know, the uh, manufacturing facilities consume the saw logs or pulp logs. And it's more of a closed system than most people perceive. In other words, the residuals from uh, saw, sawmills and plywood manufacturing go into pulp and paper mills or energy mills, OSB. You know, all of those components find, find a home because they have value. Now, these tend to be low value products that are expensive to move, but um, you know, everything kind of has a place. And then there's you know, some input from either export or imports, but this is kind of the nature of the system. And you know, in order to make the distinction from a timber perspective, are you growing big trees, are you growing small trees, are you growing hardwood, are you growing softwood, depends on who that end use manufacturing customer is. And shouldn't come as a shock to anyone, but the manufacturing facilities are located where the resource is. So not surprisingly, you see you know, softwood lumber mills, pulp and paper mills in the areas of both Canada and the US that are where the forest cover and the commercial, commercially available forest lands are. And I mean, it makes sense also, I mean, it's f simple logic, but on the other part of it is, well, would you put your manufacturing near where consumption is and move the raw material to the manufacturing? Well, why would you move bark and water when you can turn it into a product and then move product you know, um, to, to the end use markets. All right, so if we think about supply, 
we got to think about ownership. And so there's two very different tenure systems between Canada and the U.S. Um, Canada is over 90% publicly owned, and so that represents you know, lease type agreements between the provincial crown and the um, manufacturers who operate on those leases. In the U.S., the industry is dominated, or the source of raw material is dominated by freehold private property um, land. So it's a significant difference, and just to go back to softwood lumber one through four, <laughs> explaining that difference. So this slide, cool pictures, right? This dates from 2003. This is a slide I used in a team presentation that we made to Grant Aldonis, who at the time was a special Department of Commerce envoy who is trying to solve the softwood lumber crisis between Canada and the United States. But what was kind of a aha moment for him was understanding that the Canadian system, while we don't have separate um, traded transactional stumpage markets, through the lease system uses reference pricing to market. So stumpage isn't free. You know, when you, you get into this fight, it's like, well, those subsidized Canadians, we can't compete against them. They just give away their, their logs. No, that's not how it works. You have an agreement with Provincial Crown. You have, um, you know, volume restrictions and required regeneration, and you pay dues um, after those costs have been incurred by the operator. So it's very different from having, in the US, private land, produce logs, sell them in a separate, you can either sell the stumpage or you can sell delivered logs, but you can go and find sort of transactional footprints of all those things, whereas in, under the Canadian system, a little different. but. They're different, and to some extent, they're not going to change. This is a reality, and it's maybe why we've gotten all the way up to lumber five. <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's, this is the um, policy framework that we both, U.S. and Canadians, operate within. Okay. So going back to the U.S. and thinking about private timberlands, what, and the earlier question about what are they worth, well, we have in the U.S. something called the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries. Private timberlands are effectively an investment instrument. And so you can see on an annual basis the earnings, the value based on annual appreciation, but also the earnings or the um, harvest income, if you will. And so while these are cyclic, and this is both the, the U.S. West and the U.S. South, um, you have this valuation mechanism because these timberlands are traded. And if you didn't know it, real, Weyerhaeuser is actually a REIT, a Real Estate Investment trust, trust. And so that's the 12 million acre owning timberland parent that then has a separate operating subsidiary that you know, has um, different tax treatment. But this is, you know, if you're thinking about in, or talking about investment grade timberlands, one of the ways that you look at performance. The other way is just like when you're shopping for a house on Zillow, you look for comps. So transactional evidence of what Timberlands sell for on a dollars per acre basis. And so you can see the Pacific Northwest, um, higher productivity, higher value versus the US South. And the other thing, and it'll be apparent when I talk about plantation establishment in the South, um, because inventories have been rising Southern prices have pretty much flatlined. So just remember this little segment over here, which is flat, versus this little segment over here, which is rising. OK. Harvest levels. Um, Canada and the US. I think in a room full of forestry and related professionals, this isn't a huge surprise. But to a lot of people in the outside world, they think we've just been you know, mining our forests. Well, if you look at harvest levels over time, you see the impact of market cycles, the, the recession, but more importantly, we're talking about harvest levels that are actually lower than they were pre-recession. So um, we're actually harvesting less wood. And you know, from an environmental standpoint, that should be good, but it's not an accident. So raw material, um, wood inputs into your manufacturing process, that's your largest cost. So economics say, well, you're gonna find ways to conserve that. 
And this chart, while it doesn't look very exciting, is pretty important. So this is recovery rates for manufacturing by region. So the West Coast, where the most expensive raw material is, is the green line up top. And then you've got the South, uh, SYP stands for Southern Yellow Pine. And then you've got British Columbia Interior. And both the West and the South have been improving by about 1% a year. Well, not very sexy, but you're talking about a business and industry that only grows in low single digits demand. So this is you know, a, a serious incremental improvement. So why is BC different? Well, I don't think come as a surprise to anyone, mountain pine beetle. So we have this huge um, accelerated harvest at the front end of the beetle epidemic to uh, monetize the standing dead or the infected trees but the quality eventually starts to deteriorate. So even though you're investing in better mills, you're getting lousier raw material and your recovery metrics are coming down. And we're now seeing that become almost acute because there just isn't enough quality raw material to go around. And, and so the um, transactional stumpage market has exploded in price or cost and we're seeing you know mill closures. But all of this is not surprising given what we knew in 2000 as the fullness or the, the beetle infestation and its impact was being assessed and then you know planned for basically. So we, the equivalent of your, what an allowable cut effect, we're, we're gonna harvest as much of this beetle killed timber, but eventually there's gonna be a reckoning. There's not, I mean, for something that takes 80 years to grow, there's gonna be a hole in our age class distribution that will be through all of our lifetime. Okay, so uh, let's get into the sort of market dynamics a little bit here. So I'm gonna say that we have perfect competition in lumber and wood products manufacturing, despite a trade dispute and a few other things, but I'm gonna be like the, the economist who assumed a can opener. I don't know whether you guys know that joke, but you know, a chemist, a physicist, and an economist are on a desert island, and they're hungry and they have a can of food but no tools. And so the, the um, chemist and the physicist come up with these elaborate ways to try and open the can. And the economist says, no, we're just a summa can opener. Um, so is this perfect competition? Not necessarily, but um, for, for, in, for intent here, we're gonna talk a little bit about it so we can talk about comparative advantage and relative regional economics. And those supply economics, I mentioned it already, wood, wood cost is your highest cost component, but all of your supply is, is you know, determined or impacted by the tenure. We talked about that policy, especially in the case of public ownership. Um, the resource characteristics, not all trees are the same, and that's where I was going with some of this imperfect competition. It also requires this inherent assumption of perfect substitutability between different species of lumber, and that's not completely true, but it's mostly true. And then there's the manufacturing economics, which is just the brutal economics of cost and what happens to the marginal producer. And then demand, we already, I talked about, it's a derived demand, it comes from the end use markets, but let's not forget substitutes, right? There's, in home building, it props up every now and then, usually after a hurricane, somewhere in the southeast, concrete, you know, or steel or something like that. Um, and those can, you know, what if somebody invented the new extruded panel that substitutes for basically wall or flooring or roofing, that could change the world. So you wanna be thinking about that and always aware of it. But if we think about this North American market, and let's start with US demand. And overlaying that, the blue bars are US production. So there's a huge gap, and there's always been a gap. The US demands, needs much more lumber than it's capable, or at least historically capable of producing. So you have excess demand, and then this notion of substitutability, um, I'd like to you know, propose that if the price of southern pine lumber, SPF lumber, and Douglas fir lumber move pretty much in lockstep is evidence that you could trade easily between these two. It is perfect, and, and there are preferences, and then there's you know, also logistics, but they do behave the same. So that tends to reinforce the notion of substitutability. And then along comes Canada, whose demand is you know, 
almost 10 billion board feet, but whose production has been over 30 billion board feet. So we've got excess supply. So let's get these two together. And that's why we have a North American market. And it's also why we need each other, even if we're endlessly in trade court with each other. So, and this is my um, tongue in cheek slide. What if e economists were in charge? If you think about an upward sloping supply curve, and this would be the product supply curve, and everyone's got some variant of costs that are composed of um, delivered wood, CNOL is cost net of log, and then you know margin to take care of your capital kind of thing. At the margin, the last unit where price gets set, um, I would argue you have zero or almost no profit um, or margin. And if Canada is the margin, marginal supplier into the US, by definition, they've got to have those competitive costs. And if log costs are sort of a residual after the other costs, that kind of explains why Canadian stumpage prices or raw material costs not just structurally are different because they come from public lands, but monetarily, you would expect them to be lower. But economists aren't in charge. So if we think about that raw material supply curve, and by the way, this matters because if you're a private owner, that resource rent, and I'm looking at Vic, this is, this is the you know, resource economics 101 kind of idea, um, you know, goes to the landowner or it goes to the crown. And it may, for the crown, be in the form of jobs and production facilities and infrastructure being built. But that rent comes from the differences between the cost structure of the different supplying um, elements. And so, you know, by policy and law, we require re regeneration. You hopefully get paid something for your stumpage, but you've got to, you know, make these other investments. And they've all got to come out of the, you know, non-hard cost component. And that's, that's where the rent is and how it's allocated. So, you know, this in a nutshell is how our industry works economically. And you have this regional competition. So this can be US, Canada, and European imports. This can be West Coast, South. I mean, you know, it's, it's the same notion, basically. And just um, going back to price, lumber product prices again, when you look at them in constant dollar terms, and because we tend to have to think in terms of one or two rotation cycles so much longer than what would be the market cycle. We want to think about things in constant dollar terms. The fact that product prices have declined in constant dollar terms is proof of the efficiency gains and the rent being captured by the actual resource. So I don't know. I think that's kind of cool. Now, rivalry, um, competitive position. What we've got here is cost bar stacks starting with 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015, and now. And what you can see is, um, and so BC Interior, US South, West Coast, for comparative purposes, um, you know, Canada, BC Interior, low cost, low cost, low cost, low cost, whoosh. And so what happened? And again, it goes back to the beetle. And um, all the while, while they're consuming um, or monetizing standing dead trees. That's all great. And I mean, there's more going on than just that. You know, gotta look at what the Canadian dollar's doing, what the market cycle's doing, but this is a major shift in sort of the, the relative standings here. Um, and who's low cost now? It's the South. And so where they were, you know, closer, the West and, and the South, we've seen the, the US South drop in price. And that'll become clearer in a minute or two when I start talking about plantation investment. And this, I know it hurts to look at it, but this is my favorite chart in this whole thing. Um, give, me, give me a minute. So three lines on there, and what they represent is cash cost margin. So a lumber manufacturer, this is average industry cost from surveys. and. This goes back to 1984. And I think most people have heard of the spotted owl. I refer to it sometimes as forestry's OPEC moment. So what happened in the early 1990s was the Endangered Species Act was used to conserve habitat for the spotted owl. And at that time, on the West Coast, most of the harvest came from Forest Service public or BLM land. 
And so with that um, sudden constraint on supply, what we saw was log costs went up dramatically. And as a result, margins, pr product prices couldn't move fast enough. So pr margins for those mills on the West Coast got squeezed deep into negative territory. At the same time, because the price of Southern Pine and Douglas fir kind of follow each other, same with um, SPF, high lumber prices for Canadians and Southerners, um, their raw material cost didn't change that much, so they enjoyed very strong positive margins. What happens when business is good? You buy more of it, you invest in capacity. So we saw significant growth in productive capacity in those regions to offset what was closing. The invisible hand is at work here. So that's one era. And I'm not gonna go through all of the peaks and valleys, but then we had you know, the housing bubble and there were very high product prices for a while. Everybody's making lots of money, good, good times. And then of course that collapsed and then everyone's driven down to their cost floor. And again, the invisible hand is knocking mills out of production. And then we look at the post-recession recovery and it's good for everybody, but boy, it's really good if you're in the US South, why is that? Well, there's been a significant and steady increase in plantation establishment. And as a result, as lumber prices recovered, log prices didn't really go anywhere because there was abundant supply, even oversupply. And as a result, margins improved. So it was good everywhere, but it was great if you were a producer in the US South. And so you can see that the rivalry shifting between the different regions over this time. And you know, while individual facilities go out of business, it's still a vibrant and connected industry, but one region's dominant or, you know, on top of the cost curve at one point in time, no one stays there forever. These things are endlessly being arbitraged back and forth. And if we look at log prices, delivered log prices in the US, to my point, um, Southern prices, you know, post recession, flat to down, Western prices recover and on a nominal basis exceed prior peaks. If we look at it in constant dollar terms, it becomes a little different picture. This is a declining um, you know, curve. This one might be closer to flat, not really. It depends how far back you wanna go, but you know, really different behavior in constant dollar terms, but raw material, again, is driving the, <clears throat> all of the, the production and the regional economics and the regional, ri regional rivalries. So you know, we've got these um, structural events I've talked about a bunch of them, the spotted owl, the softwood lumber trade dispute, the mountain pine beetle. I didn't talk too much about curve sawing, but that whole recovery story, actually when you think about it, it was in the Eastern Canada where they first developed curve sawing technology because the trees were much smaller. And when the pulp mills needed to get more money for the lumber that was coming out of them, they you know, developed these curve sawing techniques, which was quickly embraced by the Southeast for Southern pine and that enabled an awful lot of that recovery improvement. So that's a really big deal. And that's, again, technology acting against the high cost input. On the pulp and paper side, recycling and de-inking technology paved the way for you know, sec reusing uh, products. And that impacts the market for trees. I mean, it's an environmental benefit. But what I remember is doing an early study of de-inking. And it's an expensive technology. And, and we did some consumer level work and would consumers pay more for a recycled product? It costs more to make. And the answer was, well, not really. And then you go, okay, we may have a problem here. But then what came along fairly quickly after that was large procurement organizations like the federal government mandated that recycled content be there. And then it became the cost of doing business. Every pulp mill had to have a de-inking plant so that they could run recycled. Um, Demand impacts, print media is going away. I still read a printed newspaper, my kids sure don't. Um, you know, and, and by the way, our paper's struggling, so it won't be around in five years, at least not in print form. Um, think about you know, your mailbox and junk mail, that's really gone down. They can get to you through electronic media. So things change, the Great Recession, obviously. And then this one, the plantation boom, and I'm gonna show some pictures about that. Um, but before we get there, this is another then versus now. So those 
shifting shares I talked about. If we move our time machine back to 2003, what did North America look like from a production standpoint? Canada's making about 30 billion board feet. They're just getting into the beetle thing, so interior's ramping up, coast is going about that much, so it's like 13, 14 billion board feet out of British Columbia. Um, the West produces just shy of 18, the South about 16, but let's go over here, demand almost 20. Um, so this is a net importing region. Canada only consumes eight and a half, nine billion board feet, so all that export flow going either offshore to the US. Um, so that's then, if we go to now, and this is to tee up the plantation boom, we can suddenly see that the US South produces about 19 billion feet, consumes about 19 billion feet, Canada's come down from that 30, all of British Columbia is three, four billion board feet below where it was in 2003. Um, Alberta's actually increased in this storyline, but also Quebec and Ontario have hit some of, you know, their regulatory limits, and, and so they've come down a little bit. And, you know, the West is smaller, but still a net exporting region. So that's the shifting compar based on compar comparative advantage driving towards these outcomes. And let's talk again for a moment about delivered wood and relative costs. This is kind of sp spidery looking thing, but if you look at the recession, everybody's, when product prices fell, demand for wood fell, wood log prices fell. And then in the West, they recovered relatively quickly because there really isn't quite enough raw material to go around. In BC, they started to go up, but that had more to do with beetle salvage becoming scarcer, further away from the mill, lower quality, but what's going on in the south? Flat, lower prices. So what, what's up, you know? This is it. Now, what am I showing you here? This is about 20 years of um, plantation investment by state. And so if you were to add all these up in any given year, you get over a million acres of plantations being established. And obviously, Mississippi leads the league, but th this is large scale ongoing, publicly funded CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, establishment of plantation acres. Now these are small, non-industrial, private landowners for the most part. So not all this wood is gonna be commercially available. But oh my goodness, this is just a lot of plantation acres coming on in pine. So when you see those flat prices in the south, it's a function of effectively excess supply. And if you look at manufacturing production statistics, British Columbia you know, goes through the recession, tries to recover and ramp up, but again, that beetle constraint starts to show up and we've been you know, observing less production coming out of BC every year and you don't have to, you know, unless you live in a cave, you, you've been hearing about these mill closures or significant closures in the first half of this year in the interior and it took low prices or you know, lumber price squeeze. The invisible hand only works painfully. No one volunteers to go out of business so, or close a mill. And we were seeing that happen at the same time, those you know, favorable raw material prices in the south and continuing investment, they're back to their pre-recession peak, almost 19 billion board feet. And if you look at announced capital investment from companies like Canfor and West Fraser, by the way, in the South, in addition to other competitors, there's more coming. And, and it's because there's lots of raw material and it's not expensive on a comparative basis. So that's kind of that big regional story, but you know, what's the missing part of this storyline? Well, it's us, Alberta. And this is what's interesting and doesn't fit the narrative, at least compared to our next door neighbors. You know, Alberta's also had some beetle problems, but been much more aggressive, fortunately discovering them later than, um, or encountering them later than they were in BC and maybe getting some insight as to what to do. But British, or Alberta raw material has always been very competitive and because of, you know, the differences in management, I think, you know, has, first of all, a much more stable future um, and as long as it can stay kind of the low cost um, provider, 
one of the other things that's helpful about BC being as big on the North American stage um, is that the coalition doesn't pay as much attention to them, to Alberta versus BC. Um, but Alberta, very competitive on a raw material scale. So, you know, wouldn't expect, uh, at least knowing what we know today, to see the kinds of things that have been happening in British Columbia interior to unfold here. And then finally, the West Coast. So the Douglas fir region, as it's sometimes referred to, enjoys, you know, the high productivity that climate and, and whatnot give them, but they also have access to and demand from Pacific Rim markets. And so offshore log exports to Japan have always been a high value item. Korea is pretty good, but then look at China. This thing, you know, as the Chinese economy was taking off, they needed, and it's not um, what we call structural framing lumber like we use in North America. It's, it's industrial construction lumber, so it's forms, scaffolding, all kinds of things like that. But it doesn't matter. They wanted the logs. They're willing to pay for them. That's tensioned up the raw material markets. And while lumber production, domestic lumber production in the region improved, came out of the recession, it never got back to its you know, pre-recession bubble peaks. But these markets are, the timber is fully priced. The you know, resource rent, if you will, is, is at a maximum there. The timber lands are the most valuable. I showed that. Um, on a per acre basis if you're trying to acquire them. So, <clears throat> you know, the one thing about competition is it makes for really healthy market players. You gotta be good or you're out of business. And starting with the spotted owl, there was obviously a purge after that. And, and you know, this is a, of an adaptive industry and adaptive region. Okay, so you've heard my story not everyone works for the industry or wants to work for the industry. Why should we be interested in this? Why should we analyze it? Well, if you're in government, if you're in an NGO, any other role, I mean, we're all partners in resource use and you know, commercial benefits and environmental positives and negatives that come with you know, that. So we all kind of have a stake in this. And why we analyze it is to influence, make better decisions. Seems pretty simple to me, but that's you know kind of an existential question and answer. Um, I talked about structural changes, and there's always going to be structural changes. We just don't know what all they're going to be. We know where to look in a lot of cases, um, but how are we going to, or how are you, a next generation, going to address them? Well, you're going to need that interdisciplinary toolkit. You won't all start from an economics perspective as far as your analysis goes, but if you can invoke biologic science, social science, you know, all of that, we've all got a much better shot at coming to better insight and ultimately inform better decisions for the next round, rounds uh, of structural changes. So the industry, the public sector, what we need is folks, the students at least in this room, with their interdisciplinary toolkits, but also to be a lifetime learner. Um, in our company, I am regarded as a housing expert. It's the only thing that's not in any of my formal training, but had to learn it along the way. I mean, you can't not look over there. That's where our demand comes from. And when we were getting rid of economists, they wanted a resource economist, but they didn't really want to get rid of the housing economist. So the resource economist becomes the housing economist. Well, that was a great opportunity for me, but if I wasn't willing to you know, expand my toolkit, learn more, and, and I'm, you know, that's just my personal example, my journey, but I think everyone in this room, when you think about starting a career now versus 20, 30 years ago when I started, um, graduates have to be advocates, entrepreneurial. You know, organizations are flatter, which is great from an opportunity standpoint, but you need to figure out what you need to improve yourself, be satisfied, and then move ahead. And that inevitably means it doesn't end with your bachelor's or your master's or your doctorate. What you need to be is, you know, adaptive and capable, flexible. And the world will find you if, you're, if you have those attributes. So 
Those are the kinds of things that I learned here. It wasn't just forest policy or resource economics. And I mean, I had the good fortune to be here at a time when there was almost like a family atmosphere and there was a lot of people encouraging me or working with me. Um, and, you know, it's given me, you know, a lot of help through my career, but it's also given me great memories. So this is kind of the, you know, why for, I, I, I guess I would say. And with that, I'll just finish with one of my other favorite books. I talked about Michael Lewis's book, but this guy, David Epstein, um, he wrote The Sports Gene, but he looked at, so I think people are familiar with um, Outliers and Malcolm Gladwell and the 10,000 hours of practice to be an expert. And Gladwell actually also advocates for multiple types of learning, but this is really advocating for and using you know, some anecdotal proof to, to recognize that the generalists are the ones that are the most um, successful. Now, you've got to become a specialist at some level, but it's that you are capable in multiple disciplines that matters, makes you valuable, not just to private enterprise, but also in government and, and in other, other roles. So, and you know, I think I said it to the folks that were in the policy class that I sat in on. Um, I've been lucky to work in this field for Weyerhaeuser for a, a majority of my career because they let, the situation required that I work on different things. And if I'm honest, I get bored easily. And so if you're intellectually curious and you get bored easily, you want to be solving a different problem every month or every quarter. And being interdisciplinary and, and being an open learner, a lifetime learner, is how you do it. And hopefully, somebody finds a way to reward you either monetarily or through career satisfaction and hopefully through both. But that's kind of the whole point of it all to me. And that's pretty much all I've got to say. Hopefully, I stayed within my time. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very you want? interesting and wide-ranging presentation. So we do have time for questions. I'll uh, stay near the front if you have questions. Yeah. Microphone. This one? Okay. Don't be shy. I'll start the ball rolling because people are still thinking. I was interested by the repair and remodel piece. Do you track natural disasters and how much uh, volume goes into those categories of? hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, and it's, what are you thinking about that over the next five or 10 or 20 years? Well, how we tease that out of the data is we look for spikes after and, and you know, look at regional volumes and sales. And sure enough, you're gonna go through more OSB leading up to a hurricane and then afterwards closing up windows, all that kind of stuff. Surprisingly, it's not as much as you think, um, but it, obviously would be increasing in frequency as we see more volatility in the climate and more severity in the incidences that, I mean, hurricanes have always been a fact of life in the South, but are they more frequent and more intense and therefore more damaging? We've certainly increased the number of homes that are in harm's way, just because there's more of us now than there was 30 years ago. So there is an impact or an aspect of repair and remodel demand that is tied to that. But um, the sadness around that is, wow, people have been knocked outdoors and hopefully they can rebuild and get a bunch of money and therefore some wood. But the problem is insurance payouts tend to be incomplete and take a long time. So the way that demand actually plays out isn't like there's a huge surge in the three months after an event. Um, actually drawing from my own experience when I was at Berkeley and the Oakland Hills fire hit, there was a whole bunch of homes that were wiped out and they were insured, but it took two years to be able to begin construction again because you had to get the money, you had to get the permits going and all that kind of stuff. So it does impact demand. Um, it's feathered out over a longer period of time. So it tends to not move the dial in the way you would think it would, but it is a plus. Ellen. 
So you might not uh, like, like this question, I'll put you on the spot a bit, but we have a lot of students here, and so if you have one piece of advice for them as to how they can make sure that they're moving towards this, this uh, these attributes that they need to become a leader as a future professional, what, what piece of advice would you give them? Uh, well, I mean, first one would be as interdisciplinary, be in as many disciplines as you can, subject to your interest, and don't be afraid. I mean, it's, it's really about, um, you know, signing up for stuff. So hopefully they find, you know, entry-level employment with the type of organization they're interested in. But um, what I see that's, I mean, I've been fortunate. People found me and hired me through my career. And so it was easy. I don't think that happens much anymore. Um, so if you're, you know, going out and finding your job and getting a job, you want to, you know, find out what's going on and, in effect, volunteer or try to be on as many projects, learn as many things, um, and contribute. But you also have to be pretty humble. I mean, you got to say, I know what I don't know, too. Um, but because organizations are, for the most part, flatter now than they were before, if you are entrepreneurial, there's way more opportunity than being nested just in the economic studies unit and only getting to work on certain things and having somebody above you. There's much, many fewer people above you in, in most organizations now. So the opportunity to um, discover something to, that you can do, make a contribution, and yes, you want to advocate for yourself and try and get recognized for it, that's really you know, that's a, a whole different thing than saying, I have all this book learning, I showed up and I'm here to do stuff for you, right? Um, you gotta find out what, what the business or the organization is up to and then try to find, you know, where you can contribute. Working for a, you know, for-profit company and especially being in a staff role that fits in the category of SG&A, which is something you get rid of when the market turns down, how have I added value today? Answer that question and you get to stay. <laughs> and that's sort of the cruelty of private enterprise, but it's also, it keeps everyone pretty healthy. <laughs> so I hope that was an answer. Excellent talk, thanks, um, You mentioned briefly that force provide more goods and services than just logs. But how does the industry go about showing everyone what they contribute beyond harvest? Yeah, well, that's always been, I mean, we do not tell our story especially well. Um, and we need, uh, in my whole career, we've needed to do that better. But on the other hand, we no longer have people protesting at our annual general meeting. So that's kind of <laughs> an improvement. Um, but there's a lot of really thorny problems out there um, without getting into it. But I, I heard it come up during the federal election, and it touches us just a little bit. And that is in northern Ontario, where um, uh, Grassy Narrows is. So let's say you have an FMA-type lease with the prevailing authority in the land, which is the provincial crown. And then there's a dispute, which is really between you know, a native band, indigenous people, and the administration. But they can't get any traction on it, so they go for the customer of the um, provincial crown, which would be the operator, and it isn't just us, it's, there's others like that. So how do you navigate that universe? Um, well, you've got to be as sensitive as you can, and you have to, rec you know, they have to recognize that you're still in a business. And after that, it's, it's really about, you know, trying to not mess up. Now, if the other side of your question is um, what we would call non-market attributes and benefits. Um, I was talking to the policy class, force policy class this morning, and I made a statement on a bullet that said policy is a lagging, not a leading um, indicator or attribute. So our world would be considerably simpler, simpler if we had um, better functioning carbon markets. So we could be rewarded for the carbon we sequestered, not just put into product form. And But you can't wait forever for that. So We've got to help policymakers and the public understand the non-market components and try to get, frankly, and this is me being an economist again, internalize the externalities. Um, so that's the mission. 
making it work, making it actually you know, come into action is a considerably tougher hill to climb. Um, isn't going to be resolved in my career, but hopefully we've got a bunch of people who can you know, make the, the, good, the good fight. And we're going to stand on the backs of the people who did it before us. Uh, I'm going to, I've got the mic because I'm going to ask a question. I'm, I'm going to ask you to do a crystal ball thing you've been building on that last one. I was really struck by the influence of conservation reserve program on plantations and then the influence on wood supply and all the other market effects. Somewhere, the environmental services paid for by conservation reserve were convincing enough that that program moved the whole dial. Will we get there on carbon, the carbon management in forest stock and products? What could we do to move that lever, just like the Conservation Reserve did on environmental services themselves? Yeah, and I think when you ask the question, you say, could we get there in the US? Well, no, I mean, Canada has a carbon tax. It was an election issue, but you still have a carbon tax. Thank you. Um, for, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, no one likes to pay more for anything, but my goodness, if we can't you know, start to monetize that aspect of what we're doing, We've got a huge problem. And, and you know, in the US, they tend to fight over, well, cap and trade versus carbon tax, because the public just can't stand taxes. Um, I hope, I believe we could get there, but we've, you know, keep moving in divisive, you know, polarizing direction, which makes it incredibly hard. And even the notion of climate change, there's people that say, do you believe in climate change? That's not the question. Climate change is settled science. It's a fact. Um, but if you have the deniers out there and they refuse to embrace the policy solutions, how do you turn them? How do you bring them back to a middle? And that becomes the mission. So stop being scientists. Now we've got to do some hand-holding. We've got to make friends somehow. And that's really hard to do. And I've got to say, that's outside my training. Um, <laughs> Additional questions? Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, how does climate change factor in your analysis, and how much does it influence like, future decisions in the company? Well, um, how much? That, that's pretty hard to answer in. Um, shall we say, a bond, bounded way. Uh, we absolutely recognize, I mean, you know, the, the advantage of being a large private landowner is it's our asset that is impacted by climate change. So we, we think about it and we, you know, come up with management solutions that, you know, from a strategic standpoint, we would call them robust strategies. So um, they work and maybe are optimal in a financial sense from a given set of assumptions, but then in the alternate case, which might be more severe, you know, climate change, how do we do then? And, and so we may take a lower value management option for the robustness of that strategy because we don't know how severe that, that problem could become. So that's kind of how the people I can influence, I try to get them to think about it. And then they ultimately pull the trigger on decisions, you know, seeking advice from a variety of sources. So that isn't the only um, voice. And, and like I said, I'm in decision support. So I can try, but, and I'm not the only one. And, and we certainly have, you know, on the forestry side, a whole bunch of both scientists, biometricians, I mean, all kinds of folks that are looking at the increasing variability and what does that mean? So, yeah, we're thinking about it. Um, what's frustrating is any actions that are taken now won't materialize an improvement for some time to come. So we're kind of on this path that we would like to at least come out of the dive, but there's change coming for sure, <laughs> and it's going to be with us for a while. So it becomes just like a market uncertainty, we've just increased the probability of what I don't know and it impacts and usually adversely, but in some cases it can be a positive. Um, but it really changes the value of, of different geographies. And I mean, Canada is a good example of a place, there are parts of the boreal that 
would become more productive with climate change, but it's really climate volatility that is where the biggest risk is. You could say, well, the growing conditions are improved in places that were too cold before, but if the droughts are too severe, everything's still dead. Um, so we're just starting to get our arms around I mean, I, we, I would hesitate to even say get our arms around it. We're thinking about it, but um, that is, you know, the big question for the future. So I'm sorry to be kind of vague, the <laughs> other hand type economist on you, but. I was just curious, there seems to be a lot of buzz surrounding um, the potential to build like taller buildings, like high rises even with solid wood products. Is that within your area of focus at all? Or? Oh yeah, no, we're, we're very interested in that. And by the way, there is a big climate benefit in that one. It isn't just that it uses wood. Obviously when you substitute wood for concrete, that's a renewable for a non-renewable. But if you think about a tall wood structure made of CLT or cross laminated timber, because it's a lighter structure, it doesn't require the giant concrete tub of a foundation. So it isn't just, um, it's not concrete, it's way less concrete and it goes up faster. And now there are, you know, all of the concerns around fire burn through, um, rot, all those kinds of things are mostly problems that can be managed by these new materials. And so now we're seeing the permitting allow these buildings. So now they've exceeded 10 stories. Um, they're not just demo projects. I mean, there's, uh, what's the one in Toronto that's Google sponsored? Um, sidewalk something, I, anyway, I mean, Sidewalk Labs, I think it is. So this is, I mean, so if you're in lumber or wood products manufacturing, woohoo, new demand and at a scale that, you know, this thing's gonna go 10X in the first couple of years, but that's because you're starting from a very small base. Um, they've been doing it in Europe for an awful lot longer. So this is not revolution. It's revolution for North America, but it's, it's a huge positive. Smaller carbon footprint. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Uh, there was another question about four rows down, I think. Right there. Thanks, Don. I just had a question given that you, in your career, you've gone through number one and now into number five. Um, just given the political climate that we see right now, I'm just curious on your personal prediction of when we'll come back to the table, given that we're already almost past the halfway point of the lumber beauty pot that we saw in number four. Yeah. Man, I did a lot of growing up um, intellectually through the lumber dispute. And, and so my naivete was that facts and data would carry the day um, and that you could disprove the concept of subsidy. And, and I think protectionist interests in the US are stronger than ever. And, and Canada has very successfully learned to operate in a 15 to 20% duty, either countervail, anti-dumping, or whatever, and when we've gotten them back, you know, it's a windfall. Um, but I think, well, first of all, if you really look at the history of softwood lumber disputes, there's one dating back to the 1890s or something like that. This is an old fight that's been around for a long time. <laughs> but the fact remains that the U.S. is not self-sufficient, so they're going to require imports. If imports have to be more expensive to protect US industry, Canada seems to have the capability to still meet that need. And by the way, they're the closest, um, you know, so the logistics, I mean, lumber is a bulky, heavy product. So we're always gonna have the transportation advantage. And we have an industry that's had to operate with 15 to 20% duties in place for more often in the last 20 years than not. Um, and so, sadly, I've become a bit cynical about it. I, I think it's the new normal. And, and, you know, winning the case is almost a pyrrhic victory because then it gets appealed to the WTO. It has to go through, I mean, the litigation process is just staggering. Um, and the timeline, if you're an operator and you've got to make decisions about procurement and sales for the next quarter, you can't count on the duty going away or there being a duty-free period or that you're gonna get deposits back. You gotta operate like that's how it is. And in the end, it tends to make the Canadian companies um, more competitive, but it also has led to the expatriation of that 
company capital. I mean, if you look at where West Fraser and Canfor are, are spending their money, it's in the southeast. Um, and, and that just is. Uh, I won't editorialize further. Thank you. So, Don, so you mentioned earlier that the Canadian government is so hard to replace the resources in the industry-based uh, manufacturing. So, can you tell me about uh, what is the Canadian government's current attitude towards the forest industry? Is it so hard to upgrade it, or is it just the uh, one thing? You know. Well, I think um, first of all. You know, we need to separate the Canadian government or the federal government from the provincial government because the provincial government is the one that actually controls the resource. And certainly people don't get elected when jobs are leaving a sector. And so you've got a crisis in British Columbia, which is frankly quite predictable, but there's a lot of political consequence to it. And, you know, governments, um, the British Columbia government are talking about the steps they need to take to support, and it's usually the workers and the communities that are impacted by these closures. And, you know, Canada is much more willing to provide some of those kind of supports through federal and provincial government programs, and we're seeing that. And in fact, in one of my earlier discussions today, I was talking about when I graduated, 1983 was a recession. And one of the things that helped me go make the decision to go to graduate school was I had a summer job, but it was with something called STEP, which I found out still exists. And that is kind of a... <laughs> it just got canceled? Oh, no. Well, it took 35 years. Um, but it was a job, but it wasn't a good job, and, and it was you know, important, but it was infilling through a period when there's a bunch of dislocated workers and really frustrated graduates, right? The world doesn't care that you're ready for them kind of thing. Um, and I was interested in economics, so it was really easy to make, the, and I didn't want to have to negotiate a student loan in a 15% interest rate environment too. But my point being, there are in Canada frequently support programs. The, some of them are short-lived, but there's a willingness to redistribute to support and even out the cyclic nature, the, the cruelness of the business cycle. Um, so whether it's a provincial government or the federal government or the two working together, it'll always be not enough and people will always be complaining or they'll blame the previous administration. But I take comfort in knowing it happens here um, to a greater extent than what I tend to see um, in some of the jurisdictions where we operate in the US. Does that provide you with enough of an answer? Uh, make sure, okay. Uh, thanks for your talk. My question may be a little bit strange because say, I'm not an economist at all. I'm a biologist. Okay. So I study trees. I study how they grow, how they deal with rock. My colleagues study how they deal with things like maybe multiplied beetles. So my question for you is, for folks as us with our kind of skill set and background, what kind of research, scientific research, biological research that we can do to help you do job better? Easier? Sure. Good question. Well, I'm going to tie it back to the climate change question, too. Um, you know, we do some of our own research and we hire scientists, but, you know, provincial governments through their research arms, federal government through their research arms, same thing. So they support the industry with biologic research and what kind of biologic research. So mountain pine beetle's always been with us long before my career. You know, it's always there. And it's never going to be gone. It's just the severity of the, you know, the outbreak that started in the late 90s in British Columbia. And um, so if we're always going to have the beetle, can we make a more beetle-resistant tree? Or we, can we come up with a biological control agent against the beetle? Um, I remember BT, bacteria thuringiensis, you know, so there are these solutions. Now, some of them don't work out. They take years to develop, but those are the things that have commercial value. So an enterprise like ours or through our provincial partners in places where we operate, I mean, there's always um, a thirst for 
you know, how do we solve that problem? And to go back to the cl climate change questions, I didn't cover it, but any of our tree improvement is to develop not only higher volumes, we want more fiber sooner, but we want something that won't die. I mean, always, right? And, and so if your um, droughts are more severe and more frequent, then your seedlings need to be more robust. And maybe it's the genetic stock or maybe it's the containers and the planting methods or the when you do it. Um, there's a whole you know, um, landscape of res research that could find a better way, but you don't know until you invent the better battery or the what, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I'm often caught saying, you know, we don't make iPhones here, you know, we're in a commodity business. So there isn't a lot of money to spread around. I mean, you know, think about it. If you go to Home Depot, you can buy a thousand board feet of lumber for less than $500. Now, not that you want to bring home that much lumber. It's just remarkable to me when you think about what's involved in producing that bundle, that thousand board feet of lumber. So some, somebody grew a tree, somebody harvested it, put it on a truck, delimbed it, debarked it, went through a sawmill, got kiln dried, got sorted, graded, and you can buy it for that much money? It's nuts. But that's, that's competitive. I mean, so that's the real price of lumber going down, like I was showing in that one chart. But the thing that's a constant is trees only grow, you know, 5% a year. I mean, it's the wonder of nature, but you can't push it too much beyond certain limits. But who can help us do that? I mean, you know, we try to increase our return by like half a percent through um, you know, more intensive management, genetic selection, biologic improvement. And so you gotta work hard. You can get a half a percent on the biology side, you can get another percent in the mill, cost capital on both of those. But those are the things and those are the places where um, it isn't just gonna be an engineer or an economist. It needs to be a biological scientist and, and a, a team an interdisciplinary team. So understand what the shortcomings are with current manufacturing, current product, current um, survivability of seedlings, and then work to, this is the project that makes the most sense to enhance what, what you, the, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's Provincial Crown or Warehouser Company or West Fraser, um, they wanna spend less and get more. I'm gonna ask one final question then. Okay. Looks like uh, it's about um, the route, the path of your education. So you did an undergrad in forestry, you went on and did a master's, and then a PhD, and then you went to work in industry, which I think is generally not that typical in forestry. The PhD would send you back to the university. Right. So maybe maybe you could just comment on that opportunity and what that allowed you to do, and how you made that leap in that direction. Ah, <sighs> well. So one of the things, um, this program, Stan was talking about it, you know, just turned 50. And in universities and forestry history, that's still pretty young. And one of the things, I was lucky to be influenced by some of the original faculty from, uh, and they came from other places when they were forming this department, the forestry department and now um, renewable resources. and. There was a bunch of them that were from Berkeley, so I kind of had this interest in going to the University of California because not only did they have a forestry program, but they had, well, all these Nobels. I mean, it just seemed like there was so much opportunity to go down any, any path. So that was, even in my early working years, sort of something I had in the back of my mind um, that I wasn't done. I wanted to do more. And then I was fortunate that while working um, for Forestry Canada, NRCAN, CFS, through its various names, they always had um, a you know funded uh, educational leave program. Uh -huh. So I made a few <laughs> friends, you know, and tried to make the case for it, and I was allowed to do that. Um, so you know that enabled that was an enabler. Um, so I was quite lucky. I mean, I don't know whether I was in the right place at the right time, but I got away with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> is that an answer? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you've answered a lot of questions this afternoon. Well, so. <laughs> I've tried to answer the questions I was asked, not not redirect. I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, I can be political, but I'm not trying to. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. A very enlightening. Uh, great to have you back on campus. No, it's great here. to be I here. Think, uh, it's a lot of fun. Really 
enjoyed having you here with your, your brief stay. It's much appreciated, and I hope you'll all join me in thanking Don again for a Thank fabulous. you. I do have a couple of short announcements. Can you hear me? Because I don't have the speaker on. Um, uh, those who are from the Forest Graduate Program, there are calendars outside, so please pick your calendar up. There's also uh, the new Renew is out, and I wanted to hold one up, but I didn't have one in my hand. Uh, I don't know if someone has one you can hold up. Oh, they will be at the back before. Okay, I thought they were at the table here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the next thing is the next bill. So always the first Thursday in November and the first Thursday in March is when we host our bill. So the next one will be March 5th, 2020, and it will be back to our format with the poster session over in Lister Hall and the evening of um, hors d'oeuvres and being able to view the posters for the uh, evening as opposed to the sit-down dinner. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to all join, I would like to invite those of you who are continuing with us for the rest of the event to retire to the faculty club for a beverage and a meal. And thank you all for coming today, it's been wonderful.